Today our sermon is called Tongues of Fire. And um, I kind of made this connection between uh, two stories. One is the story of the Tower of Babel in the Old Testament in Genesis. The second story is, of course, the story of Pentecost and the gift of the Holy Spirit and the tongues of fire. But both have to do with language, and that's the connection. But it's almost like two short sermons put together about these two stories, and then uh, at the end talking about their connection to us today. Our first passage comes from Genesis 11, 1 through 9. This is the story of the Tower of Babel. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly and then use the brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand one another. So the Lord scattered them from there all over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. Now I have two passages from the New Testament. The first one is from the Gospel of John 14 verses 25 to 27. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Then I have the story of Pentecost from Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism. Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, 
they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them, saying, well, they've had too much wine to drink. But Peter addressed the crowd. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, one of the things about this is language. And you know, I've done a lot of different mission trips in different areas of the world. And the one thing that made a huge difference was the ability to communicate. Not just to communicate about logistics, but to talk about deeper things like spirituality, the good news. You know, I like to go snorkeling on, on reefs uh, with my wife and on our honeymoon, uh, we went to Aruba and uh, we were on a tour of, of the island and my wife had told me that uh, she had studied French in high school and she knew some Spanish. And I thought, well, that's great. So, uh, you know, the, the guide uh, said uh, a lot of things. And he was in the front of the bus for a long time talking to us. And uh, I looked to Tricia for a translation, translation and she said, well, you know, I didn't catch most of that, but I think we're having chicken for lunch. That was good enough for me. So when I first read this Old Testament passage, it made me think about something I wrote a long time ago when I was in uh, middle school as a child. The teacher asked us to write a descriptive paragraph. It could be about anything in the world. So since I had just visited New York City, I wrote about the city and a small boy's impressions. The cars try to move faster and faster, but the roads become more congested all the time, and traffic soon becomes bumper to bumper. Horns blare and tempers are quick. Each has some place very important to go. The sidewalks are crowded with people, and each is hurrying to get somewhere. It's like looking through a kaleidoscope, the people appearing in an array of varied shapes and colors. I feel as though I'm being closed in as the buildings begin to surround me on all sides. The old is mixed with the new, creating a confusing illusion. Skyscrapers of all dimensions reach upward to the sky. They are new, modern, and glistening. The mirrored glass windows reflect the vanity of the architects. Below them are the rundown tenement buildings, a constant reminder of our ever changing times. Well, you know, many works of art or works of architecture are inspired by deep emotion and creativity, and they are wonderful. Many structures are built out of genuine need or purpose. However, all too often there are other motives behind our actions, 
motives rooted in pride or ego, greed or overcompensation. Often these more negative things are resulting from a deeper fear of rejection. Mirrored glass reflecting the vanity of an architect. Today we read about the Tower of Babel. Our story took place sometime after the Great Flood. In the beginning, all of humankind spoke the same language, and as they migrated from the east, they came upon a great plain in the land of Shinar and began to settle there. Now, Shinar was probably the Hebrew name for Sumer, located in Babylon, or what was later known as southern Mesopotamia. It was a fertile plain and an agricultural society mixed with the need for tribal safety most likely led to the formation of this ancient city. Leaders did not want the people to scatter over all the earth, and the plain was very fertile, so they said, come, let's make bricks and burn them thoroughly. Let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. and Let us make a name for ourselves. So they began to build a great city in order to preserve the unity of this human kind. With pride and ambition, they began to build a great tower to make a name for themselves in order to gain fame. The Hebrew word for name is Shem, but it includes this nuance both of fame or renown, but also of progeny. There's a lot of power in a name or a word. The tower builders are engaged in an attempt to overcome the human fate of mortality, to overcome the stigma or fear of death. It was their will to be like God, to eat from the tree of life. So for centuries, archaeologists and historians have searched for the Tower of Babel. The old Jewish tradition believed that story referred to a structure in Borsippa built by Nimrod. The Temple of Nabu was the largest one to be found in the area described by the scriptures. However, in searching for the Great Tower and contemplating human ambition and pride, the word Babel becomes pretty significant. Babel is the Hebrew word for Babylon. Another great structure is found in Babylon, though it's not quite as large as the Temple of Nabu. However, a lot of contemporary historians believe that the Tower of Marduk was the Tower of Babel. In Akkadian, the name of this tower was not called Marduk, but originally Babalu, meaning the Gate of God. So, one can see the similarities in these names. The Tower of Babalu, the Tower of Babel, or Babylon, Babylonia. Some also note a similarity in the Hebrew word Balal, which means to confuse. So there's all kinds of connections with here. Uh, their ambitions were great. The tower was to reach literally to heaven, to God's very door, heaven's gate or the gate of God. It was to be a door to immortality. The Sumerian name doesn't really sound much like Babel, but the meaning is close. They called it Adamanonki, uh, which means house of the foundations of heaven and earth. The tower was built in the classic form of a ziggurat consisting of six square stages or stories, eventually forming a great stepped pyramid. It is estimated that the tower was about 295 feet high, but built of stone and baked bricks. Unfortunately, much of it was most likely destroyed by the Persians in the time of Xerxes I around 478 A.D. So, or, uh, 
Well, Xerxes the first. I wonder if that's BC or AD. I have to figure that out. It says that the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. The Lord said, well, look, they are one people. They have one language. This is only the beginning of what they can do. Nothing they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over all the face of the earth. So it was called Babel, confusion, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over all the face of the earth. It's a story of human rebellion against the limits and distinctions of the divine and human worlds. The individual rebellion of the first man and woman has become universal and characteristic of humankind. We have come full circle in the cycle of creation. We read of early human sin and of God's destruction by flood. Chapter 8, we read that the heart of man had not changed. It was still a sinful heart, but God had made a covenant, the sign of a rainbow, never to destroy the earth with water again. The episode of the tower it's not followed by a cataclysmic devastation. The Lord had kept the covenant, yet the people were dispersed in confusion. Later, the Lord will call a man named Abram, Abraham, whose migration from Mesopotamia to Canaan is part of this great dispersal which followed Babel. There's a poem about a king. Maybe you've heard of it who in his pride built a great statue of himself so that all could see his greatness and so that he would be remembered throughout the ages and thus gain mortality or immortality. It is written by Shelley and it's called Ozymandias. But the writer only observed the fallen remnants of this great idol now laying in waste. That king, of course, was no longer alive. Buildings and architecture are a most beautiful side of humanity's expression. However, at least in this story, a tower becomes a symbol of humanity's pride and ambition. We name our own great towers after ourselves, after our ambitions. We often call that structure a skyscraper to scrape the sky to touch the roof of the world, to knock on heaven's door. Each of us, at one time or another, has tried to build our own skyscraper, or at least a metaphor for a skyscraper. Perhaps we at least wanted to make it to the top floor of a skyscraper that already existed. How often have we put our own ambitions, our own pride or greed, above time with loved ones? above our Lord Jesus Christ. Ambitions or materialism becoming a false god, an idol. That which is in our minds is what we tend to desire. This is not to say that all ambition or pride in oneself is, is always wrong. What it is saying is that we must not sacrifice our love for others or our faith in God in order to attain our goals. In fact, our goals should be from a Christian perspective on life. As for fame, the greatest thing to leave behind is not a successful career or a great monument. The greatest thing anyone can leave behind is the love which you have shown others throughout your life. This will be remembered and carried in the hearts of all you have had contact with. As for immortality or salvation, well, you already have it. Grace and faith in Jesus Christ. 
You know, when I was doing some mission work in India, I was walking through the Himalayas and I saw monks in a distance, all in a long line. They were wearing their orange flowing robes, which were blowing in the chilled wind. One thing they all had in common was these orange robes. And I asked them, why, why do you wear orange robes? And they said, because uh, it makes them look like flames in the distance. When they meditate, their first meditation is often on breathing. The second is usually on a flame from a candle. It burns brightly, it dances in the moment, and it is gone in a breath. You know, the there is a legend uh, or a tradition that the 12 apostles, uh, each one was sent to a different area of the world. And um, when I was in India, uh, the Himalayas were at the very northern point, but I spent most of my time on the very southern tip of uh, India, which is a state called Kerala. And I was working with a church called uh, Martoma Church, Mar meaning Saint, Toma meaning Thomas. And they believed that, uh, you know, when the apostles were sent out to spread the gospel throughout the world, Saint Thomas or Thomas the apostle was sent to India and they still carry on that tradition belief and name for their church today. So let's talk about Pentecost and the connections between these two stories. Well, Pentecost is seen as the birth of a Christian church and we celebrate that birthday this morning. Unfortunately, Pentecost is often a much overlooked event in the church today. It follows on the coattails of Easter, our much celebrated holiday commemorating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter is so joyous and festive, complete with lilies, hats, parades, that Pentecost is often placed in the background. Many people don't remember when Pentecost is or what it celebrates. But today, we remember Pentecost, and uh, hopefully we will be inspired by its message. And hopefully we will come to understand that it is the heart of our commission to serve as Christ's disciples, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So in today's New Testament scripture, we read of the coming of the Holy Spirit. Yet the day of Pentecost has a very ancient history. Pentecost was originally called Shavuot, weeks, as it is still found on the Jewish calendar, still called that. It was more commonly known as the Feast or the Festival of Weeks or the Feast of the Harvest. The command for this celebration along with six, six other holy days, is found in Leviticus. So Shabbat was originally a festival marking uh, the offering of first fruits from the first harvest, unleavened bread in the temple. This harvest comes early in Palestine. Later, after the destruction of Jerusalem's temple and the dispersion of the Jewish people, the day assumed historic significance for it was also known as the anniversary, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. This aspect among reformed Jews has supplanted the older agricultural custom. So it commemorates the revelation to Moses and God's people upon Mount Sinai. Many Jews have their children confirmed on this day. Uh, both synagogues and homes are decorated with flowers and grains reminiscent of the earlier origin. Many Christians also celebrate confirmation, focusing on the New Testament 
scriptural meaning. And in Acts 2, we read of Pentecost Christian history and significance. It was during the Festival of Weeks that Peter and the disciples were given the gift of the Holy Spirit. The name Pentecost is derived from the Greek word Pentecostos, meaning 50, 50 days after the celebration of Passover, or 50 days after our celebration of Easter. The festival was an exciting time, it tended to draw religious pilgrims from all over the classical world. This occasion provided a unique opportunity in which to proclaim the new message of the gospel. In the beginning of this story, we see the 12 apostles gathered together so that they might also celebrate the Festival of Weeks, just as they had gathered together to celebrate Passover, the Last Supper, 50 days earlier. There are once again 12 disciples. Even though Judas was gone, Matthias had taken his place. And after they had gathered together, a great sound came upon them like the blowing of wind. The original Greek word for wind, pneuma, can also be translated as breath or spirit, God's breath. They saw what seemed to be the tongues of flame, and these flames separated, and one came to rest on each of the twelve apostles. What an image. We notice a distant parallel between this Christian event and the Old Testament revelation of God upon Sinai, which this festival of weeks commemorates. The voice of God came to Moses like thunder and was also mediated by flames of fire. There's also a wonderful imagery in seeing these flames as tongues of fire, for the apostles then began to speak in tongues. So you've got tongues of fire speaking in tongues. And by speaking in tongues, the, the scripture means different languages. It seems that God and humanity have once again come full circle. In the revelation of God, first through Moses, then through Jesus our Messiah and Savior, but also from the separation of, hu of humanity due to their own pride and fear of death in the Tower of Babel, to the gift of the Holy Spirit and the understanding of languages so that they might spread God's word over all the earth. The overcoming of death through the sacrifice and forgiving of Jesus Christ, forgiveness of Jesus Christ. So this description of speaking in tongues it's a little different than other descriptions found throughout the New Testament. There's many people gathered around the disciples, and they represent all different nations, people who had come to Jerusalem for this celebration. Each person understands what is being said in his or her native language, their native tongue. Here, speaking in tongues is not some ecstatic speech needing an interpreter but it is an understanding of the languages of the world, languages from the Tower of Babel. All could hear and all could understand what they heard was words of praise for Jesus Christ. The, whole, the Tower of Babel and all of its confusion had been turned around. Some doubted, saying the disciples were too full of new wine, but others were amazed and joined in, praising God with the others. It even gives new meaning to the description, tongues of fire. So this is the reason the gospel was able to spread throughout the world. Imagine going to another country, trying to explain our faith in another language. Language is the first thing any missionary learns. The coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost was a spectacular event. We don't usually see that when the Spirit comes to us in our daily lives, but Christ is faithful in his promise. 
We do not believe perfectly, to be sure, but in our limited, stumbling, and sinful ways, we're still able, through God's grace, to hold on to faith. When we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us, we come to Christ, we receive him in our hearts, we love as he loves, we obey, we trust, and we have faith. Not always, and definitely not perfectly, but we simply do the best we can. In order to fill our, ourselves with the Holy Spirit, we have to let go of our own egos a bit. That's faith. Letting go of our control, of our pride, of our egos, having faith in God, in the divine other. It is the opposite the story of Babel in so many ways, giving up of ego, understanding language so that they could spread the good news, the gospel, coming full circle and reconnecting with our Creator through the sacrifice and love of Jesus Christ. As we remind ourselves that the Holy Spirit is with us each day, that we experience God's presence with us, we become more fully present ourselves. We are awakened to the abundant possibilities to love other. We become aware of the potential for awe in our ordinary lives. This is when miracles occur. We just need to open ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to all the possibilities. This is the Holy Spirit alive within us. This is Christ's promise fulfilled in our own experience and being. This is the eternal Pentecost. The church was born on this day as it acknowledged and embraced the Spirit on that great day 2,000 years ago. We are each blessed today with the Holy Spirit throughout our lives. Listen to that still small voice beneath the cacophony of the world and beyond our inner turmoil. Perhaps those times when words fail us, we can rely on the Holy Spirit. Amen.